Summer Media and Outreach Officer at the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and you join us today from our headquarters in Vienna. Now, in recent years, the OSCE and its 57 participating states have been at the forefront of global efforts to lower the risk of a cyber conflict between two or more countries, and I'm joined today by Ben Hiller. He's our cybersecurity officer at the OSCE's Transnational Threats Department. Ben will talk a little bit more about the OSCE's work in, in, just, a, in, in just a moment. But um, first, democratic elections being hacked. Um, cities plunged into darkness by power cuts and uh, personal data and even huge amounts of money being stolen in uh, electronic breaches. Cyber conflicts are already a reality, aren't they? Well, I would agree with that, though we have to be very careful when we say it's a conflict or not. But what certainly is true is that we are seeing cyber attacks more and more publicized in the media. And also, I think it is true to say that um, states are making more and more use of cyber capabilities. And it makes sense for them. They're relatively cheap and uh, can have a, quite a significant impact. And they're very stealth. It's not very easy to identify who's behind such activities. Uh, especially if they are beho uh, below the threshold of an armed attack. But the question is, is it a conflict? And I think here we have to be very careful because a conflict in a traditional sense has two opponents, a battlefield, two clearly designated armies. And when it comes to cyber, the lines are a bit more blurred. Also because uh, cyberspace, of course, is shared. I mean, we are using cyberspace, uh, you and I, uh, businesses, governments, uh, and many more, and uh, cyber has been a, a very, you know, a force for good. And to say that there's a conflict on cyberspace, maybe you might be overstating it, but certainly what it is true is that states are using more and more cyber capabilities as part of their um, strategic toolbox. Nevertheless, cyber conflicts are very dangerous, and what, what makes them particularly dangerous, mm. Ben? I think the biggest uh, challenge we have uh, still is the uh, problem of attribution. Um, we have some technical means to attribute cyber activities, but more often than not, these sort of activities are rooted through many different territories and countries. So to track back beyond reasonable doubt who's behind such activities is rather difficult and makes it uh, also difficult to hold uh, to account a per potential perpetrator. And then by default, that makes it quite interesting for um, evildoers. Um, terrorists, criminals, but also states, if they want to achieve something which is uh, potentially below um, the radar. And another difficulty is that we're not quite sure at what point a cyber activity constitutes an armed attack under international law, or whether it's just preparing the ground potentially for a future attack, or is it just good old espionage, that had we, a problem that we had for over you know, centuries and that is not illegitimate or illegal per se. So that makes it quite difficult to deal with the challenge internationally. So miscalculation, let's say, seems to be one of the biggest threats here. Is this what the OSCE is specifically working to address? Absolutely. Um, the biggest fear is that a cyber incident um, can escalate between two or more states because of a misattribution or miscalculation. Uh, more often than not, what we observe is that uh, states have uh, a disagreement over cyber activities, uh, cyber activities that already have tense relations uh, over other things such as resources. So more often than not, it would be probably neighbors uh, that already have tense relations pointing the finger at each other when there's a significant cyber attack, say for instance on a critical infrastructure, and um, they would accuse each other and that can quickly escalate in the absence of foolproof um, evidence. So what the OC participating states have done is to come up with measures, practical measures, to try to prevent the escalation over cyber uh, incidents. And essentially, they agreed on 16 uh, practical confidence building measures that uh, can be broadly put into three baskets. Uh, CBMs that allow states to read each other better in their intentions by creating transparency. Uh, dedicated communication lines, crisis communication lines to reach out to each other to clarify incidents before hitting back, basically kind of give diplomacy a chance. And the third category is uh, to enhance national resilience to cyber uh, uh, incidents. And the idea here is that you build trust because cyber, of course, goes transborder. And uh, if you don't do a homework on your national um, systems, you are a danger to everyone else. So you have an interest to protect your own systems for everyone else. And these are, this is in, in a nutshell what the CBMs are focusing on. So is the aim to 
kind of create guidelines for what is acceptable and non-acceptable behavior by states in cyberspace? Um, tangentially. Um, the key here is that our measures really focus on allowing um, states to display a norms-based behavior in cyberspace. And uh, norms and international law is uh, treated and looked at in the UN framework. What the OC is does is uh, creating a mechanism underpinning this norms-based regime. Uh, what I want to say is, for instance, if states digress from um, good behavior in cyberspace, the CDMs do kick in, the communication lines, the crisis communication uh, mechanisms, uh, efforts to diffuse potential tensions. So it's basically there a mechanism when the norms break down and, and you need to kind of come back to a norms-based uh, cyberspace. Ben, you've already touched on the challenge of attribution, um, but nevertheless, is it not important to find out who carried out a cyber attack? Absolutely. And uh, of course, if you look at the legal approach, it's always important and essential to know who exactly is um, behind uh, a crime or, or, or an incident. The challenge here, I think, is that in cyberspace, we need to um, distinguish between three different kinds of attribution and challenges. A, we have technical attribution, which is kind of going okay. I mean, states have found ways to technically prove at some point who might be behind it. Then you've got legal attribution. Obviously, it needs to stand up in court. And then you have political attribution. Um, whether you make the call and accuse some other country, for instance, of meddling in your own domestic affairs. Now, the question is, what kind of attribution is in your interest. When it comes to state use of information communication technologies against other states, political attribution or calling someone out might not always be in your interest. Uh, for instance, it could expose some of your weaknesses uh, and you could uh, attract copycat attackers. So you have to be very careful whether, A, of course, you're interested in what, who's behind it, but how do you publicize it? And is it in your interest to bring it up with another country, for instance, that you know has a much larger cyber arsenal than yourself. Uh, so you, it's, it's a sovereign decision, and a sovereign decision to call out um, potential perpetrators or to uh, resolve a situation through other means. And here the OC offers an alternative pathways to uh, use diplomacy, to ask another state, please cease those activities, or indeed ask another state through our channels to help assist to see certain activities that are believed to come from a third party. Mm. Um, so that's what the CBMs are exactly for. Okay, so attribution, I guess, is a very complex challenge, but perhaps even more fundamental or basic challenge is, is terminology yeah. that states don't seem to be able to agree on what kind of terms of vocabulary to use when talking about cyberspace. Um, and I've noticed, Ben, and I'm sure members of our audience have also, that you use the term cyber ICT security, yeah. ICT of course being information communication technology. Mm. Uh, but why c cyber ICT security and not just cyber security? You know, that is ex a wonderful question and I'm really pleased that you asked that. Um, terminology and concepts when it comes to cyber is one of the most contentious issues. And here we see a clear east-west divide, finally, um, which is quite you know, uh, natural for the OC context, I guess. Um, if you would ask Western states what they would like to protect, they would say cybersecurity. And what they refer to here is really the software, the hardware, the machinery that bites and um, you know, everything that enables uh, cyberspace and, and, and the internet. Um, if you asked uh, experts uh, maybe from a more Eastern country, um, they would say they're more interested in looking at, yes, hardware and software, but equally important is content. Uh, content can also be a danger to society. And uh, what about that? So they're having a more comprehensive view on what security is. And what uh, happened in the OOC context is a compromise, for the first time, in fact, where they said, okay, for the sake of compromise to secure in cyberspace to prevent escalation of conflict from the use of cyber capabilities, let's just say, for the moment, cyber ICT security. We're both happy with it. But at the same time, let's endeavor to work out what we mean by each terms. And then if you look at our CBMs, actually, that uh, deal with cyber, we have a CBM 9 that talks about terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, the attempt by states to look at, you know, well, how do we describe certain things? 
And that's important because if there is indeed a crisis, you want to make sure that you speak the same language, mm. that you understand each other. Mm. So this is one of the key elements, uh, if I say, um, for, for, for the CBMs. So Ben, we, we have the CBMs, the confidence building measures, um, but the threat of cyber conflict doesn't seem to have gone away. What's, what's next? Well, if I would know, I would say probably not sitting here on this uh, very lovely chair. Um, what's next? Uh, for the OC, certainly what states have decided at the last ministerial council is to continue implementing those measures, uh, those measures that uh, really are non-political. It's in everyone's interest to be able to communicate in a crisis. It's in everyone's interest to protect critical infrastructure from certain attacks, from cyber attacks, for the sake of the citizens. Um, so they made a commitment to implement those measures to prevent escalation, despite ideological differences. Mm. And I think that really is, in this world day and age, in our political environment, the way forward. You need to focus on practical measures that allow you to come back from the verge of something worse. And uh, this is what the OCE CBMs do offer. Needless to say, whether or not states implement those measures is up to every state, and it's a sovereign decision. Um, and of course, in this connection, you also have to ask the question, if you create communication channels, do you want to pick up the phone if there's a crisis or not? And this is what it boils down. Do you want to be reached if you have cyber capabilities or when they're being used? Mm. That's something only states can answer. But uh, what we are making sure here is that these uh, measures work, mm -hmm. that they're implemented, and that they're practical and useful for states if they so wish to use them. So what activities is the OSCE undertaking at the moment? Actually, funnily enough, today we started one activity, which is a communications check, testing the availability of focal points of participating states if there would be such a crisis. Uh, what states have done, they appointed a policy focal point uh, for each state that is the contact person in a large cyber attack that could threaten to destabilize relations between states, and that would be the first call. Um, so what we do from time to time is to check how available are they? Would they be having the right people on the national level they could rely on to give a whole of government response to another state, for instance, the technical community? How quick is that communication? And how deep can the conversation go? So we're testing that frequently. Another thing we are doing is to do awareness raising. You wouldn't believe how in many countries cyber is still really perceived as a technical issue only. And um, as we see now, it's not. It's a policy issue. It affects international peace and security. So it's diplomats and policymakers that need to deal with this issue. And the CBMs were created exactly for that. In the end of the day, if there's a massive cyber attack on a critical infrastructure that threatens to destabilize uh, relations between states, it's not going to be the technical people making decisions. It's going to be policymakers, decision makers. Mm -hmm. And how are, going to, how are they going to reach out to each other? Well, they're going to use those CBMs, those communication lines for the first time, which we didn't have before, in a structured manner. So we're moving away, and what we're trying to is raise that awareness in countries to make them understand, look, it's no longer good enough to just think that's nerds, you know, these are the techies, and they deal with this. No, this is affecting everyone. Everyone's taking part in, in cyber, and it's everyone's responsibility to keep it safe, and decision makers need to make decisions and need to be able to use the tools that they have created. Okay. So in short, I guess, watch this space. Thank you very much, Ben, for talking us through this very uh, complex and fast-evolving security challenge. And thank you for joining our Facebook Live today. Um, I'm Shiv Sharma, and um, if you want to learn more about our work in this area, please head to our website. That's www.osce.org. Um, thank you once again for joining in, and goodbye. <laughs>